thank you all very much for coming. I've been um, looking very much forward to this moment. As some of you know, it should have been in March, uh, but due to un unforeseen circumstances, we had to postpone it a little bit. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see so many of you today. Thank you for coming. So the first thing I would like is for you to imagine. Imagine that you are lying on a field of grass in the Swiss Alps, as I did some years ago. Around you, you hear bells ringing from the cows that are walking around. Now imagine that you have your eyes closed and someone asks you, how many cows are there? How far away are they from you? And what is the size of the bell around their neck? That's actually pretty, pretty hard to tell. Uh, nevertheless, that is an attempt to describe what I've been doing for the past four years, namely X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So X-ray, yeah, th and this is of course abbreviated SAS. So SAS is a spectroscopy that looks at how the absorption of X-rays correlate with the energy of those X-rays that hit a certain sample. So how does that work? Well, uh, SAS exploits the fact that every element of the periodic table has a specific energy at which a huge increase in the absorption of X-rays occur. So as we move toward, uh, throughout the transition elements in the periodic table, you can see that each element has a specific energy at which there is a distinct uh, increase in the absorption. So here we have the absorption on the y-axis and the energy of the x-rays that hit uh, a sample of a certain element. So what causes this uh, large increase in absorption? Well, it's due to electron excitations. And it's actually the same thing or the same phenomenon that gives color to anything. It's just visible light that hits object and excites electrons. Here we're using something a little bit more intense than visible light, X-rays. And that means that we can kick out some of the most uh, strongly bound electrons in the elements. So what happens is that when the energy of the electron hits uh, the, an atom, then that uh, one of the core electrons are excited to the continuum. And if we keep, keep increasing the energy of the X-rays, the X-ray will excite the electron and the excess energy will be converted into kinetic energy for the photoelectron that then leaves the atom. Okay, it's already getting a little gray hair, but I hope that you can still follow me. To do X-ray absorption spectroscopy, you need to go to a synchrotron. A synchrotron is a facility at which electrons are accelerated almost up to the speed of light inside a ring. Every time these electrons are deflected inside the ring, high intense X-rays are generated and sent to what we call the beam line. At the beam line, there's then a device called a monochromator that only allow X-rays of a certain wavelength and thus energy to pass through to our sample. So you can see here, the X-rays that come into the monochromator have many wavelengths presented by a white dot. And when it leaves the monochromator, it has only one wavelength presented by a red dot. The monochromator contains two silicon crystals where you can change the angle and then tune the wavelength of the X-rays that are allowed to pass through. So in that way, we can adjust the energy of the X-rays that hit our sample. When the X-rays hit our sample, no increase in the absorption is observed until we reach that threshold that I talked to you about before. Now let's see what happens when we keep increasing the energy of the X-rays. The photoelectron scatters from the main absorbing atom and interacts with the neighboring atoms, which then backscatters the photoelectron and goes back to the main absorber. 
which gives rise to an interference pattern of waves that will create the wiggles. Let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, no, that was a little bit optimistic. Um, the wiggles that you see on the curve, on the right part of the curve. That is a consequence of this interference pattern between the backscattered waves. So the first part of the curve that you see on the left, which is the big increase, is called the Zanes part. And the later part, which, look, which looks kind of flat here, is called the Exos part. Now, I will mainly be talking about the Exos part because it's, here it looks the most interesting, right? So we have the full normalized spectrum here, which is what I've been collecting multiple of. So uh, the most interesting part is the flat part, but it doesn't look so interesting maybe right now. So we want to highlight the features that will tell us something about the system. So we fit a spline function to simulate the background signal, and then we divide by that background signal to give what we call the chi signal. So you see, actually these waves going up and down is actually the uh, consequence of these, uh, this interference pattern of the backscattered waves that I talked about before. So it's basically just a zoom in on the completely flat curve, which is in reality not completely flat. It's actually some waves. And as you see, uh, the further away we get from the edge, the more noise we get in our data. Now, the final thing that I would like to introduce to you of curves is the Fourier transform. So you can do a Fourier transform, which is some mathematical operation. Uh, you can do that on the chi signal, and then you will get a curve that looks a little bit like this. Now, this is something that you can actually maybe understand because it tells you something about the distance to the nearest atoms and how many of those atoms that are. So in rough terms, you could say that the height of the peak tells you how many atoms you have, and the x-axis tells you at what distance these atoms can be found. OK, so now we uh, understand the phenomenon, um, and we want to do some analysis on these uh, experimental curves. So how can we do that? Well, uh, it was figured out that this chi signal, the wave curve, um, it is actually a sum of sine functions. One sine function for each of the path that the photoelectron can take, going to a neighboring atom and going back, or going to another neighboring atom and going back. So someone, really clever people, found out in about the 1970s that you could uh, formulate a mathematical expression that actually calculated this uh, chi signal. So as you see, there is the sum uh, sign, which indicates that it's a sum of many things. It's a sum of j, number of different paths. And all the way on the right, we just ignore everything in the middle. And then all the way on the right, we see there's a sine function, just as I told you. So this is a sum of sine functions. OK, so now we have a theoretical model, a mathematical model, that can calculate uh, those spectra that we observe when we do the experiment. Um, so what can we, how can we use this mathematical model? Well, we can build a, a molecular model and uh, calculate the signal expected for that model. So we built a model with atoms. Um, which is a quite qualified guess as to what we're actually measuring. So we'll talk a little bit about that later, but uh, SAS is actually very dependent on information from other techniques. You need to know approximately what you're looking at, and then you can get even more information. Now it's important to note here that because this photoelectron that leaves the main absorbing atom has to return again, then it puts a limit as to how far away from the central atom we can get information. So I would say a rough rule of thumb would be within 5 or 10 angstrom 
from the main absorbing atom, which would say, let's say the nearest 10 atoms looking at this model, we can tell you something about. The rest is out of our reach using this method. So now we have uh, this model and we introduce some parameters in the model that uh, vary the distance of the neighboring atoms compared to the central atom, because that's what we're measuring. So we have to introduce a variable that correlates with what we're measuring. And then we also introduce some variable that determines the, how much each atom is vibrating, called the B factor. So now we have done our measurement at the synchrotron and we have our model and then we feed it into a computer. In my research, I've been using the software called Xcurve, which uh, is a very good software program uh, if you want to study biological systems. Now, XAS is very popular with inorganic chemists and material chemists um, to study those materials, and they use other software packages, which also have some advantages, but Xcurve is really good to study biological systems. So what Xcurve does is that it takes our model, calculates the spectrum or the chi signal that we uh, would get if uh, we were measuring on that model, and then it uh, sees how well does that fit with the experimental curve. And then it tries to vary the parameters that you define for your model and see does varying this parameter create a better fit to the experimental data. And then when it cannot optimize those parameters anymore, it gives you a final model with the new uh, parameters, the optimized parameters, and then it gives you the theoretical spectrum. So you can compare the theoretical spectrum with the experimental one. And you will see many comparisons of those in my talk today. So one thing you should notice uh, the theoretical spectrum is of course very very smooth because it's just a simple mathematical uh, equation while the experimental is always getting more and more noisy uh, at higher k values. Okay, so you, uh, you have done now the introduction to XAS. You've all passed the XAS course and you're ready to do an experiment yourself. Good. Let's. Uh, look a little bit into some of the projects that I've been working on. I'll uh, talk about three, three of the projects and then in the end I'll give you a little bit of a conclusion and an output. So one problem uh, many experimentalists faces is uh, the problem of uh, radiation damage. When you do x-ray experiments you will often see that your sample get, uh, gets destroyed by the uh, highly intense x-rays because you know that x-rays are not so healthy for you and imagine this highly 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 intense uh, synchrotron radiation it would completely destroy any uh, living thing so uh, what they normally do uh, when they do these experiments is that here we have the blue square which is our sample and then the red uh, cylinder is the, the x-ray beam and then what you normally do is that you simply just translate your sample every time you want to collect a new spectrum. In that way, you won't measure something you've already burned completely uh, twice. So you just keep burning a new piece of the sample. However, this is not enough because the sample will get, often get burned really, really quickly. So you have to cool it using liquid helium, which cools to about four degrees over the absolute uh, zero point. So this is still not quite good enough. Um, and also cooling things uh, to that low temperatures also could introduce some artifacts uh, that we don't want to introduce when we want to know the real structure of our system. So I went to uh, Max4, which is in Lund in Sweden. And I did a collaboration with Kaiser Sigfrid Siegfried on Klaus, uh, who is in charge of the new beamline at Max4 called Balder, where they uh, make X-ray absorption spectroscopy on biological samples. 
So we thought, okay, could we maybe develop a microfluidics device where you simply flow the sample through the beam so fast that you don't have to translate it and you don't have to cool it. So what I did was I tried to calculate how long time can a sample survive inside the beam before it has, it has to be exchanged by a new sample. And um, using some estimations by other techniques, found by other techniques, uh, it turns out that it can survive a few milliseconds at least with the beam they have available in Lund at max four. So with the size of the beam, that would require a speed of about 50 micrometers per millisecond. Not a, uh, I don't have this in kilo kilometers per hour, but it's not too important either. And so I tried to, uh, we bought a microfluid microfluidics device and we, um, we connected it with uh, some protein sample. And then we tried to see how fast can we actually flow something through uh, a microfluidics chip without having to use two high pressures that would then uh, again damage our sample. And I figured out that at 200 millibars of pressure, we can actually achieve 200 micrometers per millisecond. So even at lower pressures, we would be able to uh, push the sample so fast through the beam that we wouldn't get any radiation damage. Now, this would be really, really interesting if I could then show you that I did this with an actual beam, but unfortunately they are, I think, just about to finish the beam right now. Uh, which was supposed to be done right about the time when I started my PhD. So unfortunately, I didn't do any measurements of this with an actual uh, X-ray source. Um, but uh, at least if in, in theory, it would work. Now one thing, another thing to note uh, about this microfluidics device is also that even if uh, some of the sample uh, is getting radiation damage. It could, for example, be reduction of some of the metal ions inside the sample or some breaking of bonds inside the protein structure. Um, then because it's so short amount of time that it's inside and because there's flow in the system, you could imagine that it's a reversible uh, reaction where the sample might heal itself before getting uh, measure again. So this microfluidics device could really uh, help the, the community in uh, bio uh, x-ray absorption spectroscopy. So that's the appetizer project, the flow cell experiments. Now let's uh, move on to the plastocyanin uh, project. Plastocyanin was interesting because um, Work done by uh, the postdoc sitting right in the middle of the room, Christian. He uh, found out that uh, some of the crystal structures that are published using uh, X-ray crystallography um, as a method, they turned out to have some errors in them due to uh, this radiation damage, and especially metalloproteins because the metal ion easily is easily reduced in some of these metalloproteins. So we thought that might also be the case for plastocyanin, which is a very well studied uh, protein using X-ray crystallography. And there were some very nice structures with both copper one and copper two and at different pHs. So I tried to just take the same samples that were already published and then try to measure them using SAS and see if there was any correlation to what is already known uh, in the public. Plastocyanin is an uh, electron transporting protein that delivers electrons from the cytochrome B6F complex to the photosystem one. Now, I might seem a little bit sketchy about this because this is biology and I don't really know what is going on, but let's try and see. I think first the plastokinone delivers an electron to cytochrome B6F, which then reduces the copper one, the copper two to copper one, and the electron is delivered to photosystem one by the oxidation to copper two again. So that's the function of plastocyanin. 
This is the structure as determined by X-ray crystallography. And as you can see, when we move towards the active side, uh, the copper ion, which is the orange ball in the middle, it is uh, coordinated by two histidines, which are the uh, penta pentagons with two uh, blue parts, and uh, a methionine, which is in the bottom, and then a cysteine, which is to the right. Um, so we wanted to determine if this coordination was actually right in all the crystal structure published, and uh, we, we wanted to do that using SAS. So Christian and uh, one of his students, Christian Sørensen, uh, went to the old Max4, which was called MaxLab, which was not so intense uh, X-rays, and they measured uh, plastocyanine with copper two inside, both some crystals they made of them and in solution at, uh, you could say, a little bit high pH and about neutral pH. What I did is that I went to ESRF, which is in Grenoble in France, and I measured plastocyanine uh, both uh, with copper two inside and with copper one inside at three different pH values um, and compared it to what he got. And these are my spectra. So the first thing you notice is that the edge position is all the same for all my six samples. So no matter the, uh, the oxidation state of copper, you all have the edge at the same position. Now, if we look into this very, very nice paper by Lung Shan Kao, uh, which studies, which has measured uh, many, many different copper complexes with both copper two and copper one, and determined the spectrum, you will see one thing uh, very clear, and that is that all the copper two uh, spectra should lie to the right, which is the dashed line here, and all the cover one samples should lie to the left, which is the solid line here. So that's one thing that's for certain. Now, why does my cover two samples then not lie to the right of the cover one samples? Well, we have just talked about it. It's probably due to radiation damage because the uh, radiation at ESRF is extremely high and I wasn't experienced enough to uh, protect my sample, let's say. So, uh, if we start by looking at the chemically reduced samples, the, at pH 4, about 6, and 8, you will notice that there is some interesting features here. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the edge, there is a shoulder there where you see that the yellow curve has a small peak, and the green one is almost completely uh, straight. So at low pH, you have a small uh, bump. And also on the top, you see that the yellow curve has split into two bumps and the green one is still intact. The blue one seems to be somewhere in between the two other curves. Now, if we go back into the very nice paper, uh, they found out that this feature on the edge um, is due to different coordination numbers of cover meaning how many amino acids are, are binding to the copper atom, you could say. And they determined that in the C graph down here, that's the four coordinate copper one complexes, and in the B one, that's the three coordinate, and if you have a really large peak in, on the edge, then it's a two coordinate copper one complex. If we overlay that with my data, we see that at pH four, we are somewhat similar to the three coordinate, and at pH six or eight, we are about having a four coordinate cover one complex. So let's compare that to the published crystal structures. Well, at pH eight, they get what we saw before, a four coordinate cover one complex, and you see, uh, yeah, nothing more to say about that. But if we go to pH six, you see that we have 50% of uh, two different coordinations. So the coordination on the left, the histidine has split away, probably due to protonation of the nitrogen. And on the right, we still have a little bit of the four coordinate present. So at pH six, we have some kind of mixture between the two as determined by crystallography. At pH four, 
it is almost entirely uh, three coordinate. Uh, there's only about 25% of the four coordinate, and you could even argue that the four coordinate, because the copper lies almost entirely in plane with the three other atoms, um, then the uh, bond to the histidine on the top is probably quite weak. So I would say that it's almost entirely three coordinate at pH four. Here we see them all overlapped, and you see how uh, as the pH decreases, then the copper ion moves down into the trigonal plane, and the histidine on the top moves away. If we look at the chi signal of uh, my three reduced samples, you see again that it looks like the pH 6 signal, which is the red curve, is somewhere in between the green and the blue one. Now one very nice mathematical feature of these curves is that you can do a linear combination of the blue and the green curve and then try to see how much of the blue is, uh, is there in the red one and how much of the green is there in the red one. So in other words, how much of the uh, three coordinate is present in the, at pH six and how much uh, eight uh, or four coordinate, sorry, is there present at pH six. So I did the linear combination, and as you see, it's a really nice fit. I just used the blue and the green curve and tried to add parts of both of them, and I got the black curve. And as you see, it follows the red curve quite nicely, and this corresponds to about 70% three coordinate and 30% four coordinate, which means that if it's only due to the protonation of the histidine, that corresponds to a pKa of this histidine of about 5.7. So that's a really nice feature that you can use uh, this SAS data with. If we go back to the so-called oxidized samples, at least the ones I thought uh, contained cover 2, we'll call them photo-reduced now because they are probably reduced to cover 1. But we don't see the difference that we saw with the chemically reduced samples. So probably what had happened is that because we had to cool our samples, then the cover two ion was reduced to cover one, but uh, we don't, the, the protein does not have the flexibility because it's cooled down so much to make the rearrangements that would uh, push the pH four structure into a uh, three coordinate cover com complex. Uh, so it still it seems to be intact in the four coordinate, even though we have cover one. And as you see, the the chi signals are also very much similar across pH. I've also included the uh, reduced uh, or the chemically reduced at high pH just for comparison. And you see there is there is a slight difference, probably due to this cooling effect. The crystal structures are also very much similar. So actually, um, what we see is what we expected from the published crystal structures. And that might be a hint towards that these crystal structures of the oxidized plastocyanine is also perhaps wrong because uh, they show the same effect as we saw with SAS. Um, which maybe we would not expect the coordination to be exactly the same uh, for cover 2 and cover 1, at least at a uh, high pH. And especially when we then compare to Christian and Christian's data, we see uh, that their data are here the dashed and the dotted lines, and they lie to the right, as we expected my data to do. So if we look back into the graph I showed you before, we see this difference where the cover two signals lie, lies to the right of the cover one signals. That is what they saw when they did their experiment. So there might be a difference between the cover one and the cover two coordinations anyway. So I tried to take Christian and Christian's old data and fit a model to that one to see if there was uh, any difference with the crystal structures that were published, or with the models that 
I uh, determined from ESI. And as you can also see in the chi signal, there's also a difference between the green curve that I measured at ESRF and the black curves that they measured at the old maxima. So these are my fits to the old data. You see here for the high pH crystals and here the fit for the uh, neutral pH solution. And if we look on the right, then you see that uh, there is some what of a shorter distance to one of the histidines, but the other three uh, coordinating residues seem to be at about the same distance. So what we might suggest from these results is that if you don't photoreduce the sample, then the histidine might actually be closer. And that is also something that we might expect as with cover one, we saw this histidine flipping away. So this is actually maybe the real structure of plasticine with cover two bound. And that was the plasticine project. Now we take it up a notch and finish off with the amyloid beta project. Amyloid beta is interesting because it's associated with Alzheimer's disease. And about 60% of all the people in the world with dementia has Alzheimer's. And the National Knowledge Center for Dementia in Denmark have predicted that the amount of people with dementia will steadily increase over the next few decades. So that will also mean that we will get more and more old people with uh, Alzheimer's. And this is simply because we become, there will become more and more old people in the society because people live longer. So it's very, very interesting to study uh, Alzheimer's and how we can possibly treat it. So how is amyloid beta related to Alzheimer's disease? Well, uh, the brain of people with Alzheimer's uh, was studied and inside it, you found these plaques. And this plaque contains uh, fibrils of amyloid beta. So each of these sheets consists of two amyloid beta peptides that are folded together. So uh, the scientists thought, okay, somehow, if we only see this amyloid beta fibrils in the brains of people with Alzheimer's, perhaps it's somehow related to the sickness. So they thought, okay, can we somehow stop this amyloid beta from appearing in the brain and thereby cure uh, Alzheimer's? What was also uh, found in these plaques was a high, higher concentration of iron, copper, and zinc. So perhaps these metals have some effect on the disease as well. Um. Ah, yes. So where does these amyloid beta peptides come from? How, why are they even present in the brain? Well, uh, it comes from this amyloid precursor protein, which is basically the protein that later becomes amyloid beta. Because it has this name because no one really knows what it's actually doing except becoming amyloid beta. And the way it, this happens is that a group of proteins um, or this amyloid precursor protein is sometimes cut, cut by a group of proteins called uh, alpha secretase, which cuts it right about here. And actually that doesn't matter, that's okay. But it can also be cut by a different group of proteins called beta secretase. And if that is followed by a cut by a third group called gamma secretase, you get the amyloid beta peptides. So now we have our amyloid beta peptides in solution in the brain because of this amyloid precursor protein. Uh, in reality, now I've just shown it as a black uh, cylinder, but in reality, uh, it looks somewhat uh, like this, like some kind of alpha helix with some random coil also, which is which this structure has been determined by NMR. Um, so that's why we might better picture it with a cloud because it's somewhat, uh, it can change between many different coordinates or uh, structures. 
Now, if we have many of these uh, clouds in the solution, they might clump up into an oligomer. And these oligomers are maybe uh, what causes the toxicity in the brain and thereby causes Alzheimer's. So we don't want the oligomers to appear. What might also happen is that instead of being this random uh, coil structure, it might also fold uh, in beta sheets, which we can picture here as a disk. And those disks might then align up and give our fibro structure, which was the one we saw before that uh, was found in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. So the the simple uh, explanation here might be that the fibrils are actually more of a symptom that you've had Alzheimer's or that you've had oligomers present at a point. And the faster you can form the fibrils, the less likely you are perhaps to become sick. That's just one idea in the uh, vast uh, ocean of theories about Alzheimer's disease. Now the fibril as I showed before, is actually some layered beta sheet uh, structure. Now I just want to show the sequence of this amyloid beta peptide. So each of these letters represents an amino acid. Uh, the red ones are the ones that are hydrophilic, and the blue ones, no, of course not, it's the other way around. The blue ones are the hydrophilic ones, and the red ones are the hydrophobic ones. So you see in the C terminal of this uh, peptide, you have a lot of hydrophobic ones that are the one that forms the uh, beta sheet and then forms the fibril, while in the other end you have the hydrophilic that wants to be in contact with water because they are hydrophilic. And they are also the ones coordinating uh, copper and zinc and these metal ions. So, uh, to complicate this study a little bit more, or maybe to focus it down, I don't know. And we wanted to look at two variants of this amyloid beta peptide. The first one is one where we have an A2T mutation, which means that we took the alanine side chain, which is somewhat hydrophobic, and replaces it with a um, hydrophilic side chain, threonine. If you have this mutation, you are less likely to get Alzheimer's. If we have a different mutation at the same position in the peptide, where we replace the alanine with a valine, which is more hydrophobic, then you are more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. Now this is in the beginning, in the end terminal of the peptide, and also where the copper and the zinc are bound. So we thought maybe all this is somehow related to each other. Maybe the binding of copper and zinc and these mutations are somehow related to the fibrillization and the oligomerization. So we wanted to study, um, we wanted to study how this uh, copper and zinc binds in these variants. Now I just want to go a little bit uh, through the background on uh, what was already known in, uh, in the community about the binding of copper in amyloid beta. So one study here tried to see if uh, the binding of copper uh, changed depending on how much of the peptide you included. So you see in the beginning it says alpha A, A beta uh, 1 to 16, 1 to 28, or 1 to 40, depending on how, how much of the peptide they included in their study. And they see that all of them using SAS, they saw that all of the coordination, uh, all the spectra they get out are the same, and thus the coordination must be the same, uh, no matter, well, not entirely no matter, but at least for these three lengths, it gives the same coordination. So that means that we might as well use the short version of the peptide to get the same uh, coordination of copper, at least in solution. A different group tried to see if adding different amounts of salt into the solution would affect the binding of the copper. And as you see here on the right, uh, the spectra look very much alike. So 
no, salt does not have an influence on how copper binds to amyloid beta. A third group then said, okay, uh, what the others suggested with the uh, uh, six coordinate and the five coordinate is completely uh, outrageous because our bond balance analysis tells us that it can maximum be a four coordinate uh, complex of cover. Um, so uh, they dismissed they dismissed the previous coordination and fitted this four coordinate with two histidines. Now I might uh, just skip this one because I see we are running a little bit late and then uh, go to the last, the new study which uh, was done just last year where they showed that the amount of histidines that coordinate to the copper uh, depends on um, the pH. So they did almost the same as I'm about to show you where at a lower pH you get fewer histidines coordinating probably because the histidines are getting protonated. Now the studies on amyloid beta with zinc is not so, there are not so many studies on uh, this complex because that zinc is silent to EPR. That means that a very common tool used to uh, study amyloid beta with copper cannot be used with zinc and thus there are not that many uh, studies on it. Uh, but you can still study it with NMR and X-ray absorption spectroscopy, of course. And uh, the most, uh, let's say, the highest agreed upon groups, two histidines and uh, one uh, or two uh, side chains with a carboxylic acid side chain. So this is the starting point with the variables. I didn't include the length of the peptide, but that's also a variable. But we could look at uh, amyloid beta in a monomeric state, the oligomeric state, or the fibrillar state. We can look at how it binds with copper or zinc. We can vary the pH, and we can look at three different variants. Now we chose to look at just these three variants out of many possible uh, variants uh, because they were already studied by uh, some of our colleagues at E2. To simplify it a little bit more, we decided to not look at the uh, coordination of carbon and zinc in monomers or oligomers, but only in fibrils. So, I, uh, we applied for some beam time at uh, the synchrotron in France and we got on our way and then when we uh, came to the experiment, it was to the beam line and tried to measure our sample, it turned out that the samples that I had spent many hours in the lab preparing turned out to be too low in concentration. So we had to really quickly prepare some new samples that we could measure now that we had our, I don't know, 72 hours or 48 hours of beam time. So we, uh, it was a little bit a mixture of uh, different uh, samples that we measured, but at least some of them uh, were treated with um, some shaking to induce fibrillization, but not all of the samples were uh, treated with uh, shaking. These are all the curves, and I've also included two curves from a study uh, that I showed before by uh, the Graham George group in Canada. Um, so the dashed black line is where they measured the effect of radiation to the binding of copper in amyloid beta. Then you will get the dashed line, and if you don't damage your sample at all, you will get the solid black line. Now, as you can see, all my colored samples are somewhere in between, so I didn't completely uh, destroy my samples, and, but not all of them are completely untouched by radiation damage. Now, another important point to note here on the highlight that I put in is that the uh, bright green curve and the pink curve from the A2V variant at pH 9, they both have a single peak where the others, most of the others have two peaks. Now these were the samples that were not treated with shaking, so somehow this uh, fibrillation uh, procedure causes some, somehow a different coordination of cover, it seems. If we look at 
all the chi signals here on top of each other, there's not that much of a difference to be seen. Uh, but if you look at around 4.5 uh, Armstrong inverse, you see that some of the, at least the bottom curve has just a single peak. Maybe it has some wiggles or some noise on the top, but most of the others have several peaks. So there might be some differences uh, across these samples anyway. Now, one thing that was annoying looking at this data is that I saw some differences, and here we see it in the Fourier transforms as well, but I don't see uh, any uh, correlations to the parameters that I vary. So I don't see any correlation between whether I measure wild type or the A2T mutated uh, peptide or the A2B variant or across pH. I don't see the correlation between the variants that, that I see and this, these parameters. So I tried a little bit of a shotgun approach. I used these seven different models, and then I tried to fit all of them against all of my data. So I got seven times, I don't know how many data sets I had, maybe 12, a number of different fits, and then I here show the best fit for each data set across all seven models. And as you see on the left, the uh, red dashed line is my uh, theoretical spectrum, which fits quite well, I would say, with the experimental black curves. And in the Fourier transform, it also seems to describe the signal quite well. That gives rise to these uh, final models after the optimization, and you see that for the HUV, we have a five coordinate cover two with three histidines. For the wild type, we have a four coordinate with three histidines. And for A to T, it changes between a three coordinate at both low and high pH and a five coordinate at pH eight with two or three histidines. The missing models are the ones from the data which weren't high enough quality to give chemically reasonable uh, parameters. So if we compare this to what was already known about how these mutations affect the binding of copper, uh, another study showed by Aaron Kumar, who uh, worked on the project before me, uh, showed that the PKA for one of the histidines binding to the copper is the lowest for the HUV mutation, a little bit higher for the white type, and the highest for the A2T. So if you can say something, at least there are also three histidines coordinating at pH 7 for the A2B, but not for the A2T, where it only appears three coordinate at pH 8. It doesn't quite add up at pH 9, but the three coordinate uh, copper is also known as the uh, coordination that happens when you have photoreduced uh, copper um, present. So these three coordinate structures that I found as the best fit to my experimental data might be due to the radiation damage once again. Or oh, a few minutes. Two minutes. Perfect. Uh, so just a quick look at the uh, sick data as well. Um, I found out that some of the sick samples had uh, a lot of zinc oxide in it, which you can see here from the Fourier transform, because it has a large second peak. It must be due to a close second zinc ion. Um, but the ones that did not have any zinc oxide inside, uh, I took on, and they turned out to be quite similar. And the best fit was very similar to what was described in literature with two histidines and two carboxylic uh, side chains. So to wrap up the amyloid beta, we uh, have some different uh, copper coordination and one zinc coordination. And then we'll go to uh, my final outlook, the final slide, which is that I think my thesis may be a very nice introduction to people that are new to the field. Um, for biochemists looking to do X-ray absorption spectroscopy and want to know about the challenges and the, uh, what you can do with the method. Now, radiation damage is a 
big concern within anyone who does uh, x-ray experiments with biological systems. So both uh, microfluidic cell and um, using SAS may be important tools in avoiding that. The current limitations of SAS is probably related to computational power because of uh, the models and the theoretical models require a lot of computational powers. And then also the user friendliness of the uh, software that you use to um, do this uh, modeling. So with that, I would like to thank the organizations behind my project, Interreg for sponsoring part of my PhD, ESRF and Soleil for granting me beam time, Danscat for paying the trip, and all these people for their invaluable inputs along the way that I collaborated with. Uh, and of course, all my colleagues at DCU Chemistry, which I've been enjoying very much to work with. And finally, of course, I would like to thank you all for coming and for listening to me for a little over 45 minutes. <laughs> thank you.